welcome to my Toyota 200 series touring build. Here we are at episode eight, and it's finally time that we jump into the car and take a look inside. Now, some people refer to this area as the control center. I'm not sure that I really like that term. It's not Star Trek. We're just talking about a Land Cruiser here. But let's jump in and take a look at the control center of the car. So the first change you'll immediately notice when you jump in the car is the gigantic Tesla style screen that's there. Anyone that's had an early model 200 series will know how horrible the standard head units in these cars are. They suck for Bluetooth audio and they have really, really bad navigation. I got around this by fitting an aftermarket Bluetooth audio streaming module and hard mounting an iPad mini on a RAM mount in the car. This actually lasted me for a long time because the iPad mini allowed me to run all of my navigation apps, including HEMA maps, and also use my Apple Music subscription to stream audio to the head unit. So new laws came in in Queensland and it meant I could no longer touch the iPad even if it was fixed in the car. So I started looking for alternative options and the EC vision and sound screen that I have now was the perfect choice for me. So because this is a Sahara edition, the air conditioning is controlled via the head unit. That means there aren't very many options when it comes to aftermarket head units that you can get. Speaking with the team at AC Vision and Sound, they said that their screen would tick all of the boxes. So a quick trip down to the Gold Coast and those guys fitted this unit up. And so far I have to say, I'm pretty impressed with it. Now, while I am impressed, I'm going to throw this out there that there are a few issues with this screen. And that can be expected when you're fitting a brand new aftermarket head unit to a 12 year old car. For starters, the phone buttons on your steering wheel don't work anymore. Now I'm sure that this is just a software thing and it's probably something that will be patched and fixed later on, but standard out of the box, these buttons won't work and you have to answer and hang up phone calls on the screen. The next thing is that the screen doesn't have a SIM card in it. So you have to Wi-Fi via a personal hotspot from your phone to the screen to get things like the maps and everything on the screen to work correctly. Next, the audio experience out of this head unit isn't the best from the factory. It needs a little bit of tweaking and there's a million menus that you have to navigate your way through to find it. I'm going to post a future video update on exactly what menus and how to get to them and what settings to change that'll help you fix this if you're in the same position with this head unit as I am. The good news is once you go through these little steps, the audio experience you get out of this head unit is really, really good and the car stereo sounds just as good as Toyota intended it to be from the factory. The last thing that's a little bit of a problem in this head unit was the Wi-Fi. Now, as I said earlier, you have to personal hotspot your phone to the head unit to have Wi-Fi capabilities. But for some reason, my head unit kept disconnecting and had a lot of problems. Now, I got around this by putting a high powered access point from my house internally in the car and leaving the ignition turned on overnight. This allowed the head unit to do updates and eventually it came good and now it works perfectly. Now, moving down underneath the head unit, we have my ARB links, and this thing is brilliant. I have to admit, I'm a little bit of a minimalist when it comes to the inside of the car, and I don't like having too many screens, which is why I decided to put the ARB link screen down here in front of the gear shift knob. Now, when the car's in park, it is a little bit hard to get to the screen, but as soon as you're driving and the gear shifter is out of the way, the screen is easily accessible for any of those buttons or changes that you wanna to make to the link system. Now, through the links, I have complete control over my air compressor and the rear airbags in the suspension of the car. Plus, I have my Selfie Go and a couple of camping lights connected through to it. I don't have any of my driving lights that are on the bull bar or my roof-mounted LED light bar controlled via the links. These are just still controlled via buttons on the dash. This is because the links only has six outputs, and if I was to put all of them on, I would fill the links capacity right up. From what I have now, I have three spare slots in the Lynx unit so that in the future, if I have anything else I want to control via the Lynx unit, I have that capability. Overall, I love the ARB Lynx unit and I can highly recommend it for anyone that wants to control rear airbags in their car. This thing is leaps and bounds above the competition when it comes to controlling your rear airbags. So anyone that has this, I highly recommend spend the extra money, get the ARB Lynx unit. Moving across from the Lynx screen, we have my GME UHF. Now, I don't have a clue what model this GME UHF is. It's just a unit that has all the controls on the handset. 
The UHF was one of the first things I had put in the car, and at the time, the GME XRS that everyone now uses was only brand new to the market and was about double the price of this unit. To be honest, I couldn't see the advantage in going for the more expensive XRS, so I threw this one in, and it's been great. When installing a UHF into your car, there's a million different mounting options for the handset, and I think I've nailed it in the 200. It's just the right spot, so if you're out on the tracks or driving in convoy, you can quickly grab it and speak to your mates. On the left-hand side of the steering wheel, I have my Red Arc Tow Pro Elite. And anyone that tows with a vehicle knows that these things are the bee's knees when it comes to electronic brake controllers. Especially when you're towing off-road, this thing gives me maximum control over the brakes in my trailer and allows me to go places that I really wouldn't think I would have been able to go with our caravan. In the same area, I have my stock lock lock-up converter buttons. Now, these come as a genuine Toyota button from stock lock, and it has a two-way button for my unit, which is an auto setting and a low speed setting. For more information on the stock lock unit, throw some questions in the comments below, and I'll be sure to point you in the right direction. Now, moving over to the right-hand side of the steering wheel is where I just have a standard switch panel, and I have the Toyota-style buttons for my driving lights. You'll see that I have one for the front spotlights and shoulder lights, which are linked together, and then one for my LED light bar that is on the roof. For people that run out of space in that area, there is an aftermarket company who makes a larger switch panel for that, and I'll put a link to them down below in the description. Otherwise, in the control center, the only thing that I have is a strike phone holder. Now, this was in the car when I bought it, and I've just updated the actual holder to suit my iPhone. It does only charge your phone. It's not a mobile phone booster. It's not a data link to the screen. Now in the future, I do want to upgrade this unit so it has a data link to the screen. Right now, if I want to use Apple CarPlay with the screen, I have to plug the phone in manually via a white USB cable that just floats around in the cabin. If I upgrade the strike holder so it's linked to the screen, this means as soon as I slot my phone in to be charged, it will automatically connect to the screen and allow me functionality such as Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Now, you will notice that I have left the original RAM mount for my iPad in the car. And there's a specific reason for this. One, it covers the holes that are there. But two, and most importantly, it allows me to still use the iPad mini on the RAM mount holder for long trips. You see, having the iPad mini running HEMA maps on its own is a really good advantage next to the Tesla screen if I just want to run standard Google Maps or Apple Maps for standard navigation. Having the iPad mini there also means that at the end of the day, we can take it out of the car, we can look at where we've gone, or we can plan tomorrow's trips in the HEMA map. So that's it for episode eight on the control center of my car. Remember that there is one more episode to come out. So if you haven't already subscribed, jump over, hit the red subscribe button, and click on that notification bell so you're notified when the next episode comes out. It also means that there's seven previous episodes that I've already released. So jump over to my channel and check out the 200 series touring build playlist for the previous seven videos. I'll also put links for them in the description below. So that's it everyone, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.